Good morning. Welcome to God's house, and thank you for coming to worship this morning. I am the resurrection and the life. These words of Jesus remind us of a crucial truth that because of the consequences of sin, we will die. But our Savior leaves no doubt that he has power over death. As we worship this morning, we keep in mind that Jesus is our Lord and our life. We begin this morning with the opening hymn, Come Thou Almighty King. Please stand. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Blessed are they whose transgressions are forgiven, and whose sins are covered. Blessed are they whose sin the Lord does not count against them. Let us confess our sins to the Lord. Almighty and merciful Father, we have strayed from your ways like lost sheep. We have followed what we have devised and desired in our hearts. We have offended you and sinned against your holy law. We have done those things that we should not have done, and we have not done those things that we should have done. Have mercy on us, Lord. Spare us, forgive us, and restore us according to your promises in Christ Jesus. God. 
God, our merciful Father, has forgiven all our sins. He sent his Son, Jesus Christ, to be our Redeemer and Savior. Jesus paid the penalty for our guilt by his death on the cross and freed us from death by his resurrection from the grave. We have peace with God now and forever. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace of the whole world and for the well-being of the church of God and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. Let us pray. Eternal God and Father, help us to remember Jesus, who obeyed your will and bore the cross for our salvation, that through his anguish, pain, and death, we may receive the forgiveness of sins, victory over the grave, and finally inherit eternal life through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our first scripture lesson this morning comes from the Old Testament book of 2 Kings chapter 4. Here the Lord demonstrates his power over death by using his servant and his prophet Elisha to raise a Shunammite's woman back to life. Shunammite's woman's son back to life. But the woman became pregnant, and the next year, about that same time, she gave birth to a son, just as Elisha had told her. The child grew, and one day he went out to his father, who was with the reapers. He said to his father, My head, my head. And his father told a servant, Carry him to his mother. And after the servant had lifted him up and carried him to his mother, the boy sat on her lap until noon, and then he died. She went up and laid him on the bed, and the man of God then shut the door and went out. 
She called her husband and said, Please send me one of the servants and a donkey so I can go to the man of God quickly and return. Why go to him today, he asked. It's not the new moon or the Sabbath. That's all right, she said. She saddled the donkey and said to her servant, Lead on. Don't slow down for me unless I tell you. So she set out and came to the man of God at Mount Carmel. When he saw her in the distance, the man of God said to his servant Gehazi, Look, there's the Shunammite. Run to meet her and ask her, Are you all right? Is your husband all right? Is your child all right? Everything is all right, she said. When she reached the man of God at the mountain, she took hold of his feet. Gehazi came over to push her away, but the man of God said, Leave her alone. She is in bitter distress. But the Lord has hidden it from me and has not told me why. Did I ask you for a son, my Lord, she said. Didn't I tell you don't raise my hopes? Elisha said to Gehazi, tuck your cloak into your belt. Take my staff in your hand and run. Don't greet anyone you meet, and if anyone greets you, do not answer. Lay my staff on the boy's face. But the child's mother said, as surely as the Lord lives and as you live, I will not leave you. So he got up and followed her. Gehazi went on ahead and laid the staff on the boy's face, but there was no sound or response. So Gehazi went back to meet Elisha and told him, the boy has not awakened. When Elisha reached the house, there was the boy lying dead on his couch. He went in, shut the door on the two of them and prayed to the Lord. Then he got on the bed and lay on the boy, mouth to mouth, eyes to eyes, hands to hands, and he stretched himself out on him. And the boy's body grew warm. Elisha turned away and walked back and forth in the room and then got on the bed and stretched out on him once more. The boy sneezed seven times and opened his eyes. Elisha summoned Gehazi and said, <coughs> Call the Shunammite. And he did. When she came, he said, Take your son. She came in, fell at his feet, and bowed to the ground. Then she took her son and went out. This is the word of the Lord. <clears throat> we'll now continue with our psalm of the day as it's printed. Psalm 130, with the Lord there is mercy. I'll sing the refrain the first time through. The congregation can sing it again after that. And then I'll sing the verses, and the congregation can join in on all the subsequent refrains. <clears throat>
Our second lesson comes from the Apostle Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 8. These words will also serve as the basis for today's sermon. And if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his spirit who lives in you. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation, but it is not to the flesh to live according to it. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. The Spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the Spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in his sufferings, in order that we may also share in his glory. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. For the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. This too is the word of the Lord. Alleluia. I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me will live even though they die. Alleluia. Now in honor of the words and works of our Savior, please stand for today's gospel. The gospel according to St. John chapter 11 here the Lord again demonstrates his power over death, this time by Jesus himself raising Lazarus from the dead. On his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Now Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem, and many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them in the loss of their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed at home. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she replied. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who is to come into the world. Jesus, once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. But Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, by this time there is a bad odor, for he has been there four days. Then Jesus said, Did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. Then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, Jesus called in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen, and a cloth around his face. Jesus said to them, Take off the grave clothes and let him go. Therefore many of the Jews who had come to visit Mary and had seen what Jesus did, believed in him. This is the Gospel of the Lord. You may be seated for our hymn of the day.
grace and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. In 1905, a man named Frederick Wells was conducting a routine inspection of a mine shaft that he supervised. And as he walked along the dark path hewn from the rock, a flash caught his eye. Intrigued, he approached the mine wall, took out his pocket knife, and pried the glimmering crystal from it. And as he turned it over in his hands, his first thought was, no way. There's no way this is real. It's, it's too big. It must be glass. See, Frederick Wells was standing in the mine shaft of the premier diamond mine in Cullinan, South Africa. But what if it were real? He took the rock back to the surface, to the mine manager's office, at which point he handed it to the clerks who threw it out the window. They couldn't believe what Wells was suggesting. To them, this rock had no value, just a worthless crystal. But upon further examination, it would be discovered that that worthless crystal was exactly what both Wells and those clerks thought it could not be. This diamond of dazzling clarity and weighing 3,106 carats, or about 1.4 pounds, was the largest diamond ever discovered by far. But imagine if Wells had listened to those clerks. Imagine having something of priceless value, but failing to understand its true worth. That diamond was eventually cut into nine major gemstones and 96 brilliance, the largest of which became the biggest clear-cut diamond in existence and was given the nickname the Star of Africa. Today, the Star of Africa resides in the Tower of London as part of the crown jewels. When Britain's next in line becomes monarch, there the Star of Africa is with them at the tip of the scepter held in the new sovereign's right hand. Its worth is estimated at over a billion dollars. And what did the crown pay to acquire such a treasure? Nothing. A stone thought worthless by some turned out to be priceless after being given away for no cost. What would you do if you knew that you were the next in line to inherit something like, like that, a billion dollar diamond? What would your worries consist of? Where would your priorities lie? How would you treat other people, or how would other people treat you if this was something of public knowledge? Now, I can't answer these questions for you, but I can say with some degree of certainty that nobody in this room would be worried about that diamond being given to anybody else. No, it's my inheritance, and I am its heir, and although it's not in my hand right now, well, it's still mine. In our text this morning, Paul calls us Christians something that we don't get called very often. He calls us co-heirs with Christ. But what does that mean? What do we stand to inherit? Where's the value in that? My fellow redeemed, when the Holy Spirit came to each of us and created faith inside of us, he sealed us as heirs. Heirs that stand to inherit Christ's death. 
heirs that stand to inherit his spirit, and heirs that stand to inherit the greatest treasure of all, the crown jewel of Christianity, Christ's glory. But that inheritance didn't come without a price, a steep price. See, when God created the world, he created it without sin. But when sin entered the world through one person, it came to all people. All of humanity was tainted with the defiling mark of sin and immediately cut out of God's will and testament. We stood to inherit nothing but suffering and death forever in hell. And all of that before you or I were even born to commit a sin. See, that original sin in and of itself is enough to condemn us. It pushes us outside of God's family, and it tells us that we have an obligation to follow. What Paul calls an obligation to the flesh. An obligation to sin. To the sinful nature that is a part of each of us. The sinful flesh that craves exactly what God denies it. And if we live our lives according to that obligation, well, Paul's pretty clear with us. We will die. And no amount of following the rules or doing good deeds to make up for our sin or, or comparing ourselves to others saying, God, yes, I know, I confess, I am a sinner. But at least I'm not that sinful. No amount of any of those things will ever satisfy an obligation to the flesh. And Paul knew this perhaps better than anybody. Born as a Jew of the tribe of Benjamin, circumcised on the eighth day, as zealous a Pharisee as there ever was, faultless according to righteousness based on the law, a Hebrew of Hebrews. All these things Paul calls himself in Philippians chapter 3. If anybody had the confidence to boast in the flesh, it was Paul. And yet in Romans chapter 7, the chapter immediately preceding our text for this morning, Paul can do nothing but confess to his God that the good that he wants to do, we can't. And the evil that he doesn't want to do and knows he shouldn't be doing, we can't stop doing that. An obligation to the flesh leads only to despair and to death. And if that's the obligation that you and I follow, well, we find ourselves right there in Romans chapter 7 with Paul saying, Who will save me from this body of death? Well, Paul knows who. His very next words, Thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. Through Jesus Christ our Lord who died for us. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who rose again for us. We have inherited Jesus' death, his saving work on the cross for us. His death for us is the death of our sin. His death for us is the death of our death. United with him through baptism into his death, we are no longer slaves to sin, or to the fear of our own death. We have no obligation to the sin that was paid for with the only price that can satisfy the blood of Christ shed for you on the cross. But notice that Paul doesn't say we have no obligation. Instead, he says we have an obligation to the Spirit. The same spirit that made you his dwelling 
when you were baptized, the washing of rebirth and renewal that took away your sins assures you that you are co-heirs, sharers of Christ's death. And this same spirit lives in each of us. In your baptism, you received the Spirit of God who testifies on your behalf that this person, this son or daughter of yours, Abba, is not guilty. But the Spirit of God in you is not just a blessing to be enjoyed or a witness to point to. It's also a power. A power that's hard at work. The Spirit grants us the ability to fulfill our obligation to Him, to live and to do as our God commands, to praise and thank God in worship, in confession and absolution, in song, in our day-to-day lives, to continually shed our sinful nature and put on the robe of righteousness purchased for us in the death of our Lord Jesus Christ. To approach God whenever we want in prayer, bringing to his feet any worry, fear, pain, request, praise, thanks, anything you have, you can bring to God whenever you want. That's power. And that incredible power at work in you and in me testifies along with our own spirit that we are God's children. We share in his death. We share in his spirit. And if we share in those two things, well then we will share in Christ's glory. Where there was once slave, there is now son. Where there was once sin, there is now righteousness. For there was once death, there is now life. But how easy is it for us to feel like the opposite is true? God, where is my freedom when I look around and I see other people gratifying their sinful flesh with seemingly no consequences? God, where is my righteousness when I'm the one now called to a life of confession? God, where is my life when it feels like the whole world is united against me, antagonizing me, making fun of me, dismissing me as a fool for believing what I believe? Jesus came to bring sonship and righteousness and life, and he did bring those things, but he never promised us that those blessings would make us society's movers and shakers, or that they would win us any friends. As Martin Luther once fam- famously said, if they crowned Christ with thorns, well, don't expect the world to crown us with roses. Instead, what Christ promised us was suffering. So maybe in the face of that suffering, in the face of exactly what Christ promised us, well maybe instead of doubt or frustration, we can respond with rejoicing. We can respond with rejoicing in the face of our sufferings and our afflictions, because even though the promise of Christ's glory, life eternal in paradise, isn't fully realized on this earth, it's still ours. It's still a fact. As certain as the rising and the setting of the sun, the wall between the present and the future that seems impenetrable to us, well, really, it's as thin as air. And in fact, to God, who lives outside of the confines of time, the wall between the present and the future, it doesn't exist at all. The sufferings 
we experience on this earth have no power over us because we know who we are. We're co-heirs with Christ. Co-heirs with Christ. Could anything be more certain? Clothed with Christ, co-heirs with Christ, we are certain of our standing before our God, holy and blameless. We are certain of our redemption. And we are certain of the paradise that awaits us at the time that God appointed for each of us before the creation of the universe itself. So what do we do now? What about the meantime? Well, as Psalm 130 says, we wait for God. We wait for God in this world of suffering for his timing. And Paul tells us that all of creation waits with us. The birds, the trees, the grass, the fish, the cats, the dogs, the sun, the moon, the stars, all of it is yearning for the day that we are revealed. The day we emerge from our hiddenness, suffering, and shame. The day we come forward as who we are. Justified children of God who do not shrink before our Father who judges all. On that day, we will see him, and those who ridiculed us will be terrified, but, but not us. No, we will see him and we will approach him as a child approaches a gracious father with nothing but love in between us. With our own two resurrected eyes, we will see the prophet Elisha and the Shunammite woman and her son. With our own two resurrected eyes, we will see Lazarus who walked out of his tomb on his own feet, but head and shoulders above it all, we'll see him. The nail marks in his hands and his feet, the spear wound in his side, the sunshine of his radiant face. We'll see it all. My brothers, and sisters in Christ, fellow heirs with Christ. That's what it means to be an heir. Think of what we stand to inherit. We inherit Jesus' death, his work on the cross for us. We inherit his spirit, the spirit who in your baptism brought you two things, tomb and womb. Our sinful nature was put to death, tomb, and a new creation, a new son or daughter of God was born, womb. The spirit who gives you the ability to fulfill your obligation to him, and this obligation is our joy. But most importantly, we inherit Christ's glory. A glory that will make even the most intense of earthly sufferings vanish without a trace. A glory that all creation is yearning to be revealed. A glory worth waiting for. That's what it means to be co-heirs with Christ as you and I are now and will be forever through the love of our Lord Jesus. Amen. We continue with the confession of faith on the top of page eight in your worship folders.
you have a physical thank offering today, you can leave it in one of the baskets on the way out of church. We also have an electronic giving option. If you're visiting with us today, we'd love to have a record of your visit. You can sign one of the connection cards that should be in each pew as well and put that in the offering basket. We'll now continue with our prayer of the church. When it comes time for special prayers this morning, we'll offer one for our brother in Christ, Anthony Darden. Anthony had a heart attack last weekend and is now recovering in ICU in the hospital. Please stand for prayer. God of all grace, we thank you for the gift of eternal life in your Son. And by the resurrection of Jesus from the dead, and by the faithful testimony of the apostles, you have assured us that our faith stands on a sure and solid foundation. Though we do not see Jesus with our physical eyes, help us see him with the eyes of faith. Through your Holy Spirit, breathe on your church that it may faithfully proclaim the gospel of our risen Savior with courage and diligence in all lands and to all people. Grant that we also may be illumined by the heavenly light of your word, and so keep us in the one and only true faith. Preserve us from the assaults on our soul, deliver us from doubt and despair, and preserve us from worldly wisdom and false teaching. Forgive the sins of your people, strengthen the doubting and the faithless, bring back the forgetful and the wayward, and comfort the anxious and the distressed. Lord Jesus Christ, you are indeed the resurrection and the life, and you promise us that whoever believes in you will live, even if they die. Let that truth give rest to our hearts, both in times of health and in times of sickness. Let it especially rest in the heart of our Christian brother, Anthony Darden, as he remains hospitalized after his heart attack. We place his days and his times in your hands, trusting your gracious will be done in his life. We, all, we also place his wife, Alice, in your hands, asking you to give her strength and peace during these trying days, and asking you to keep her hope firmly in you. Now hear us, Lord, as we bring you our private petitions. As we go from this holy place today, grant peace and rest to us all. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, in whose name we also join together to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. You may be seated. The Sacrament, page 8. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Praise to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In love, he has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. He sends us the Holy Spirit to testify that we are his children and to strengthen us when we are weak. Therefore, with all the saints on earth and hosts of heaven, we praise your holy name and join their glorious song. Thanks for you have become myself. 
Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. principles that the Lord lays out for reception of the sacrament are summarized for you on the bottom of page 9. Out of love for those principles, we ask that only members of this congregation or another Wisconsin Synod congregation come forward to receive the sacrament this morning. Also note that during distribution, we'll sing hymn 663 in the blue hymnal, Soul, Adorn Yourself with Gladness. Those hymnals should be located in all of the pews. Come for all things are now prepared.
please stand for prayer. Hear the prayer of your people, O Lord, that the lips which have praised you here may glorify you in the world, that the eyes which have seen the coming of your Son may long for his coming again, and that all who have lived, who have received in his true body and blood the pledge of your forgiveness may be restored to live a new and holy life. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. 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 Let's remain standing for our closing song. may be seated. Good morning again to all of you. Thanks for joining us in the Lord's house. It's great to see you here. All the announcements that you need to know are printed in the news and notes section of the service folder as well as the weekly calendar that's back there. Uh, I'll again highlight that this is the last Sunday of our summer schedule, so next week we return to uh, our normal Sunday schedule, which means no more Thursday services throughout the, the school year here, and then we'll return to our two Sunday services next week, 8 o'clock and 10.30, with Family Bible Hour in between. Uh, Family Bible Hour, the adults will be studying the book of Jonah in the Fellowship Hall. During that same time, all of our children are invited to attend Sunday school. Uh, as you see in the announcement under Family Bible Hour, we'll have two different sessions. The kids up to 6th grade will meet together, and then our 7th through 10th uh, graders will also meet together for a different study. And then everybody who's older than that, 11th grade and up, will just have you come and join us for the adult study. I think those are the announcements to highlight. Please take this chance to say hi to those who worshiped with you today. <laughs> 